Good morning. Hey, you all look good today, all right? It's good to see you. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm happy to be here. I think I'm crazy to be here today. You know, you, 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 turn, you, you hit your 60s and you think you're still 30-something, all right? Uh, you know, four months ago when uh, Ashley's wedding was scheduled for 7.30 on a Saturday night, I said, no problem, you know, 7.30, Sunday morning, I'll be just fine. Yeah, I wish I was home in bed. That's because that's where Shelly is, all right? <laughs> she said, you're the pastor, I'm not. You better go. Uh, <laughs> anyway, for those of you who are guests, you're saying, who is this weird guy today? Uh, actually, I'm the pastor whose daughter got married last night, so uh, it was a great day. Um, we have a, we got a, I think we got a couple of pictures. The, uh, um, <clears throat> Wasn't she a beautiful bride? She even makes Victor look good. All right. Now, Victor's handsome, too. He looked really good last night. I don't know if there's a couple of more. That's the only one. Uh, there we go. Mother, daughter. Oh, yeah. That lasted about uh, eight steps. That's about all I know to dance. All right. That uh, kill a little time before the wedding started. All right. After pictures were finished. So, anyway, it was... Uh, it was a terrific evening. The, the photographer uh, sent those to me at 5.30 this morning. He said, maybe five or six of these will tide you over till we get the rest of them ready for you. So um, I wanted to know what he was doing up that early because he was up almost as late as I was last night. But uh, he's just a terrific guy. He actually had been uh, one of Ashley's teachers in high school. And uh, he's the guy responsible for getting all of our video equipment here and doing the initial training on it. So... Just a terrific guy who, uh, who was our photographer last evening. If you are a guest here at New Hope, this is your first time to visit with us. Thank you for being here. You honor us by your presence. There's some communication cards in the pew in front of you. I would love for you to fill one out, drop it in the offering bag when it comes by. You're going to say, oh, but you might annoy me. Uh, I promise you we'll do our best not to. We don't call on the phone. We don't knock on your door. But through the mail, we send information that we hope will answer questions you might have about the church kind of ministries we're engaged in, what we believe, who our staff is. So we'd love to put that in your hands. Those cards are also for our regular church family. They have prayer requests, messages to staff. Um, please use them for that. Drop them in. If you give me a prayer request, like on a Sunday morning, please write it down on that card. Drop it in. I will forget it by tomorrow if you don't do that. All right? So please, appreciate you doing that. Um, I want to, uh, you can tell I'm scattered this morning, but I, I, I want to share a praise item and then a prayer request. Um, um, I'm not sure how to say we're related, but um, okay, uh, Ashley's dad's sister. Does that make us in-laws? <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, had the opportunity to meet him just on a couple of occasions, and we're here for the wedding last night. Uh, if you notice the U-Haul truck out in the parking lot, they are the ones driving that U-Haul truck, and they are not moving anywhere. They were on their way down from Northern California to the wedding yesterday, and a motorcycle going the opposite direction on the freeway crossed the divide, plowed into their car, and rendered it non-drivable. The great news is this is the praise item. Neither one of them were injured, and so we say thank the Lord for that. Stockton obviously doesn't have really good car rental service because they could not find a car to rent in the city of Stockton. Pretty ingenious of them. So they called the U-Haul place and they rented a U-Haul truck, which turned out really good <laughs> because they used the U-Haul truck last night to take all of Ashley and Victor's presents back to their condo. <laughs> So it worked out really good. So we are, we are grateful for that, and I'm so excited they've come to be with us this morning. Uh, let me highlight a few other things, and then we'll, um, we'll get engaged into our worship today. There, uh, uh, the the sign-up sheet is going to come around today, and there's three things on here that pertain to two ministries of our church. The one on the top is Vacation Bible School Volunteers. Vacation Bible School is going to be the last week of June. It's our, uh, it's our way of... Uh, 
some, some pretty in-depth teaching to kids in our own church and also reaching out to kids in our community. And uh, they need volunteers, some to teach, some to assist teachers, some to do crafts, some to help prepare snacks, some to help set up and tear down displays uh, that, that will help accent the lessons. Uh, all kinds of ways in which you can help. And if you'd be willing to help, it's in the morning this year. It's going to be, I think, from 9.30 to noon. And if you would be available, would you please put your name and your contact information on here, and they will follow up with you ASAP. Underneath the VBS, we have two different forms. Both of these pertain to Celebrate Recovery. I believe it's explained in your bulletin, but in case you don't read, let me highlight those real quick. Uh, no, number one is if on occasions, this is not a weekly thing, but if once every few months you would uh, be willing maybe to help out with child care. All the child care at Celebrate Recovery is, one, you don't have to change diapers. All of them are already potty trained. Um, and they go up no older than sixth grade. Rarely, Eric, I saw you here. Where are you, Eric? All right, um, rarely is there more than four or five. Yeah, that's probably a big number. It's usually only a couple. Uh, and if you would be willing to be uh, a volunteer to help out once every blue moon, uh, if you'd put your name on here and your phone number, uh, that would be very, very helpful. We'd like to expand the pool that we already have. And then underneath that one is also for Celebrate Recovery. They serve a meal before their uh, evening study and meeting. And uh, if you would be willing to help, uh, you don't have to be in charge. We've got a person who's in charge. But if you would just be willing, again, on occasions, not very often, to, uh, to help assist in providing a meal for that night, if you would sign up on that one with your contact information and folks will follow up with you. And so um, I have one of these to go down each side. Thank you very much. Uh, Let's see here. Pasta feed coming up June the 4th, and uh, they'll start selling tickets uh, next Sunday, I think, for that. This is a fundraiser for our kids, 4th, 5th, and 6th grade, who will be going to Heartland Camp. And uh, it's, a, it's a great evening event. It's dinner here. It's a very inexpensive dinner here. And then we'll also be having uh, raffle prizes. So raffle tickets and uh, meal tickets will be available, I believe, starting next week. Um, sanctuary remodel, slight change from what was put in the program. It will be this week. It just won't be Monday uh, because we have a memorial service here tomorrow and a memorial service here on Tuesday. And we're going to start after that. And um, any other memorial services after that, we'll just have no bathrooms, all right, uh, in this building, okay? So, uh, but anyway, things will be getting started this week. Um, we have four brand new AC and heating units on the jam building. Uh, that was all finished this week, so the uh, heating and cooling will be much better and much more efficient than it's been for the last couple of years. Um, those were the oldest units on the property, and they were needing a lot of maintenance, so uh, those things were done this past week. I think those are all the updates I need to bring you there. Let me highlight a couple of prayer requests. Actually, another praise item. Jerry Brown, stand up. It is the first time to see Jerry Brown in church in a couple of months. All right. Woo! Here's, yes, sir, you may say something, but you can't cry. I just want to thank everyone for all the prayers and their well wishes and all the happy times that they had to give me as they wished me through this. Thank you. Very good. You, you, you made it. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Jerry, uh, Jerry's got more stents in his heart than anybody uh, probably alive um, and had some pretty unusual treatments done, and he's just he's had a tough time kind of bouncing back from the last one, and so it's great to have him here today. I've got news for you. There's another Jerry Brown who hasn't been in church longer than this Jerry Brown, so keep praying for Jerry Brown, all right? And um, uh, I didn't say one thing about his politics, all right? I didn't say anything. There's a, uh, I do want you to be praying, continue to pray for the Bropes family who were part of our church fellowship. Jim was in the 8 o'clock service. We had his memorial service for his 52-year-old son here this past week. It was absolutely terrific. Um, uh, Doug loved the Lord. Doug had a rare disease that he was born with, uh, lived till he was 52 in that battle, and uh, just had a wonderful, wonderful time celebrating his life. Folks came all the way from Florida to be in the service on Wednesday. Uh, he was in the sound engineering business and worked 11 years at Hume Lake, handling all of their sound needs up there, and then worked for a large company down in Southern California. But I do remember Jim and uh, Doug's sister, Linda, who were part of our church. Tomorrow will be a service here for Wayne Morgan, 
and uh, you'll hear more about Wayne later on the service. And then on Tuesday, Mike Garrison. Mike was into uh, racing, both boat and automobile, so some of you might recognize uh, that name, very active in that area in the valley. So uh, we're so very, very grateful for that. In our 1045 service, we do have a baby dedication, and that is going to be for Hazel Grace Martin. So Phil Martin's, there she is. So we'll be doing that in the next service. She is just absolutely precious. She never cries when I hold her. So I, I really love Hazel, all right? And so that's something that you all don't get in this service, but the 1045 will. Uh, we are so blessed to have uh, a couple visiting with us today. Uh, they are from Mexico. Yeah, that's where they live now. They were from the U.S., and then they've been in Mexico for several years. You'll hear part of that story. They are uh, a couple that our church family has been associated with for the last few years. We have been engaged with them in our Mexico mission trip that our high school kids go on and our volunteers. And um, they are going to be with us tonight because tonight we have a special event here at 530. It is our Mexico mission night. Two things will be happening. Number one, you're going to get fed. If you have walked into the surf area or the kitchen over in the jam center, it smells just like a restaurant in Mexico. All right? It smells so, so good. They are going to be preparing carnitas. The Hutchinson boys who cook on this last Mexico mission trip are cooking tonight. And um, they are going to be cooking all afternoon. And uh, you're going to have carnitas. And it looks like taco, car carnita tacos, right? All right? And uh, it's going to be really good, so come back at 5.30 for that. And then uh, following the meal uh, is going to be uh, sharing about the Mexico mission trip. And Ron and Carol, who are from that area, help direct what we do down there, uh, are going to share more of their story. And then you'll hear testimonies from our high school kids and some of our volunteers who went. So they would love to have you back. Would it be helpful to see a hand up of how many might be coming back? Teddy, would that be helpful? Chris, would that be helpful? Oh, I didn't... I couldn't see you standing back there, Chris. All right. Raise your hand if you think you'll be able to make it back tonight. All right. Okay, I'm looking at about 30 in here. All right. I would say I didn't do it over there, but I know some who told me they were. I'd say another five there. Okay. So, good. All right. Hope you can make it back and see what's happening tonight. So, to just to kind of whet your appetite, and maybe more of you will decide to come back, Ron, would you come on up? Ron is married to Christy. Teddy, you are surrounded by Christie's, all right? Teddy's wife, Christy, is sitting on one side. Way back there, Christy. All right, Ron, no, no the other, other Christy now. All right, there's Ron's wife, all right? Ron, thanks for being here today. <laughs> so I uh, got to share in first service earlier this morning. I was telling them I walked in the kitchen, and St. Hutch Rose can definitely cook. I ate a little bit of their food so, uh, when they were in Mexico, so yeah. I encourage you to come back tonight. It was great. So, I'm going to give you a little bit about, about myself, my family, and, uh, and what we are doing down in Mexico. Um, we've been down there for about seven years now. Uh, we've been doing ministry full-time down in Mexico. Um, my wife is here, and my daughter is not today. She is living down in Mexico with her new husband. They got married in October, and so they are, they are here. Um, sorry, I forgot. And I've been told I'm not loved enough. Um, so my daughter and her husband live down in Mexico. They've been got married back in October. The, my son is around somewhere. Uh, he heard there were youth here that he hung out with in Mexico, and so he has disappeared. So he will be around at some point. Um, and then my wife and I uh, have the privilege of being here. We've been married for 23 years. Like I said, we've spent the last seven years down in Mexico down there. Um, the last few years, we've been working full-time with Calvary Chapel down in Rosarito. Uh, I had never heard of Calvary Chapel before we moved to New Mexico, uh, so I got introduced to them after we got down there um, and just have loved our time down there. Our, min our ministry there with Calvary Chapel is taking care of the teens that come down. That's how we get hooked up with you guys. So we get, we get the opportunity to work with your team when they come down uh, to Mexico. And I have to use my notes because if I don't use my notes, then I go off track and I just talk for 20 minutes and then Tim gets mad at me. So excuse me, but I have to use my notes. So, um, so we've been working with your youth down there now uh, for three of the past four years uh, while you've been coming down to Mexico. Uh, so that's been a fantastic opportunity for us to do. A little bit about what your youth have been doing down there. Um, we've got a, hey, there's the family. Look at that. 
Um, so a little bit about what the youth have been doing. We've been working on a project called Casa de Los Angeles. It's uh, going to be a, an orphanage or a children's home down there uh, that's going to be able to house about 30 kids uh, that we'll be able to take in off the streets and, and out, of, out of some pretty bad situations down there. Uh, it's going to be a 30,000 square foot facility. I'm sorry, a 10,000 square foot facility for 30 kids. There we go. I'm getting my numbers right now. Um, so about a 10,000 square foot facility. It's three stories. Um, that's a picture of the building that your team has been working on. It doesn't quite look like that yet, um, but the next few pictures you'll see is what the uh, is what the building actually looks like at this point. Um, it's pretty much just under construction. We've got a big hole in the ground at this point. Uh, they've got a few walls up, um, and it's just going to continue. It'll be an ongoing project for the next who knows how many years until it gets done, um, and that's fully dependent on on time and money. So, uh, but that's the that's the project. I. Should have taken a picture looking out at the view because from there you get about 180 degrees of ocean view. So it's really kind of cool. Of course, you are a mile away from the ocean, so you're not really there, but it looks good from there. So um, so that's a little bit about, about the orphanage and about, about what's going on there. The other thing I wanted to just share with you quick is what we personally are involved in down there in Mexico. About last March, so March of 2016, um, we started a team ministry house down there. Uh, we've got space for 30 people. We've got beds for 30 people um, in the house there. We leased the property for the first year, and then at the end of the first year, we had the option to either purchase or leave. Um, so we thought we'd check it out and see what, see what God wanted to do with the property. Um, we worked really hard at raising funds for about 10 months and got almost nowhere. And we thought, okay, well, this isn't what God's got going. Um, the last two months of the year, God decided to drop $100,000 in our lap and said, here, I'm going to raise the money for you. We needed to raise $55,000 for our first payment that was going to be due in March of this year. Uh, we obviously hit that and surpassed that. And so we stepped out in faith and made an all-cash offer um, on the property. Uh, so we have another $40,000 to raise in order to be able to fulfill that. Um, I have somebody that's willing to loan me the money if I need to to, to balance it out. Um, but we need to raise about $40,000 to, to be free and clear on the property. So that's our other big challenge. It's neat to see what God's doing up there. We've got all kinds of opportunities as far as expanding the space, um, but that's, that's, the, uh, that's the deal of what's going on with that. You were all given a prayer card when you came in, hopefully. Um, so you've actually seen my mug before I got here this morning, so that's good for you or bad for you. Uh, but that's that there, um, and we just would love to have you guys continue to pray with us, um, continue to support your, your youth uh, as they make trips down to Mexico to help out down there, and uh, any of the rest of you that want to come down, I'm sure we can work out a way to get you down there to help, uh, help out with things that are down there. So thanks very much. They'll be sharing more of his personal testimony tonight um, at our Mexico Mission Night. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. We are going to have our morning tithes and offering. If you would come, please, would you join with me as we pray? Our Father, I love you so very much. I'm exceedingly grateful for your unconditional love for us. Whether it's a good day for us or a bad day, your love never, ever changes for us. Thank you for that. Father, the scripture tells us that even before the creation of the world, you knew about our rebellious heart. You knew that we would stray and run, and yet you created us anyway. And it says that you already have a plan. Even before we messed up, you have a plan to fix our mess up. That is unconditional love. And then, Father, 2,000 years ago, you completed that plan. You sent your son, he came. He lived, he died, he suffered extensively for our sin. And you raised him up on the third day. It is that plan, and the fulfillment of that plan, that gives every one of us in this room hope. Hope that death doesn't have the last word. Hope that sin doesn't have to govern and reign in our lives. Hope that we're not controlled by the circumstances of this world, but we, Father, can surrender our lives to the control of a God-driven purpose. Thank you so very much for that. Thank you for, um, thank you for Ron and Christy and the work that you're doing in and through them and their family in Mexico. Thank you for the opportunity that the church family here at Newville has to team up with that church family in Mexico. 
all for the purpose of your kingdom work. And it's not about Calvary Chapel. It's not about New Hope. It is about the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the privilege of sharing the ministry there. Thank you for what you want to do in our time together today. May we be encouraged and our hearts uplifted as we praise you. May we be challenged by your word as it speaks to us. May we be submissive to your leadership as you provide direction for us. For the privilege of giving and sharing today, we say thank you. You have blessed us beyond our wildest dreams, and we are so grateful for your provisions. We give to you, Father, with a joyful heart. We trust all this in the incredible, awesome, the marvelous, and matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you've, um, if you've been around uh, New Hope very often, if you've uh, heard me speak uh, too many, very many times, uh, you know one of my favorite stories about perspective uh, is, but I'm going to tell it again anyway. You see, I think perspective is significant in our life. Perspective is really what determines uh, the way we live. Perspective really determines the way we die. Perspective determines what our outlook is towards what there is after death. So I think perspective is pretty significant uh, for us on a daily basis. And uh, one, of my, one of my favorite stories that I, that, that's encouraging to me, and, and it's one I, uh, I told last Thursday, and it's one I needed for this morning, but it's about the little boy who was walking through the house with his baseball cap on and bat and ball in his hand. And as he was walking through the house, heading out to the backyard, uh, his mother overheard him say as he was talking to himself, I am the greatest hitter in the world. And he got out of the backyard and he got on the grass area and he threw the ball up and he took a big swing and he missed and he said, strike one. I am still the greatest hitter in the world. He tossed the ball up the second time, mighty swing, missed it again, strike two. I am still the greatest hitter in the world. Tossed it up for the third time, missed it again. I am the greatest pitcher in the world. <laughs> and um, I, love, I, I love that boy's perspective. And um, th there are times I need to be reminded of that, uh, that God can take our strikeouts and he can turn them into something very good in our lives. Uh, when our tank is on empty, God provides. Uh, we need to learn to let him provide when our tank is on full so that it's him and not us that's engaged in that process. And I was reminded of that again on Thursday, and I'll tell you that in just a moment, but uh, it was a reminder that I, I needed this morning. Uh, for those of you who are regulars at New Hope, um, I'm doing what I rarely do today. I'm breaking the series. Um, I know many of you came today anticipating hearing what the antidote, what the cure for jealousy is. Come back next week and we will get to the cure for jealousy. For those of you who are new, we're involved in a series called Enemies of the Heart. Uh, the Bible says that this heart, that invisible part of us, not this physical flesh and blood heart, but that part of us in, in, in our life that we can't see but we know exists, that thing in us that when somebody we love enters a room, our heart just goes pitter-pat. Uh, that thing when somebody else enters a room, our heart just seethes. Um, uh, but it has enemies, just like our physical heart has cholesterol and high blood pressure and other challenges. So this invisible part of ours, the Bible says it's, uh, it's, it's, it's desperately wicked and sick. And we've been looking recently at what the enemies of the heart are, and we've, we've, we've looked at the subjects of guilt and anger and jealousy. Um, I just missed one. Grief. What? No, I'm greed. Greed. Thank you. Told you, it's on empty. Uh, and, and so we identified the four enemies and talked a great deal about them, and now we are walking back through and looking at what the new habits, the healthy habits are that can get rid of, uh, of, of, of guilt and anger and greed and jealousy. And so we'll pick that back up next week. Uh, but, but let me tell you what we're going to do today. Uh, let, me, let me quote two passages and then I'll get to it. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 9 says this. And remember, the wisest man who ever lived wrote the book of Proverbs. Uh, the book of Proverbs is not, quite frankly, the book of Proverbs is like a train wreck. Uh, it's, it's scattered all over the place. There is not a, a, a significant rhyme or reason to the way that the book of Proverbs is organized. It is a collection of short, pithy sayings that have significant impact upon our life. 
Um, and they're not even organized by subject matter. It's just kind of like, these are the things I don't want my kids to forget when I'm dead and gone. And he just started writing them down. And as soon as a new one would pop in, he would write it down. And so there's a couple of verses I just want to draw our attention to. We're still talking about the heart today, but in a slightly different way. And um, this is what Solomon wrote in 16.9. In his heart, a man, a person, plans their steps, but the Lord determines his steps. That's important. Then Proverbs 37.4. The wise man said, delight yourself also in the Lord. Solomon is saying, you have a choice to make. You can find a lot of, lot of things to delight yourself in. What are you going to choose? What's going to be, first and foremost, the delight of your heart? And for those of you who are still looking and kind of looking at me, that's Proverbs, Proverbs 37.4. Delight yourself also in the Lord. What? Oh, 17 4, I think. Did I type it wrong? Is that it? Psalm 37 4. Takes on empty. Psalm 37 4. Uh, you guys are a lot smarter than this. 7, 8 o'clock service, though, because they didn't catch that. All right? Or none of them bring their Bibles to church, one or the other. Um, but delight yourself in the Lord. Do you choose to find your delight in the Lord? Where, where will you choose to find it? If we make the right choice, then notice the outcome. And he will give you the desires of your heart. You see, often what we do is we flip that around. And that is we want the desires of our heart and hope God delights us. No, it doesn't work that way. Choose to delight yourself in the Lord, and then He will give you the desires of your heart. Because here's the kicker. When we delight in Him, we're probably going to see a change in the desires of our heart. <laughs> and that's a good thing. Now, that being said, let me tell you why I'm, I'm, I'm preaching this today. Uh, Mike, this is a rerun for you. Here's why. Um, since Ashley set her wedding date, I told him in the office, Thursday and Friday before the wedding, no appointments. Keep my schedule clear. I, I knew that for two reasons. Um, number one, there would be a lot of last-minute honeydew chores. Number two, I knew I needed some private time to get ready for the service. Um, Ashley, as Corey had been, Ashley was a coordinator, wedding coordinator with me for about five years. She's heard every wedding sermon numerous times. <laughs> you could look back at Corey during some of the weddings and she could mouth everything I was going to say almost next, okay? Uh, and, and Ashley was pretty much at the same place. And so it, 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 it had to be something new. It had to be something fresh. It, also, it's, it's a daughter. And so I knew, though I had things I'd been collecting and preparing, I knew I needed some of that time on Thursday and Friday. The only thing I had on my schedule for Thursday was uh, 6 a.m. men's Bible study. Finished that. All the guys were gone by 7. I had sat down at my desk. I had just started getting my thoughts organized. And, and I knew I needed to have some other work done because I there's a funeral here tomorrow and there's a funeral here Tuesday. So, Tim, all right, this is good. I got the whole day. 7.25, my phone rings, and I'm in shorts and a T-shirt and a ball cap, all right? I, mean, I, just, I, 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 I don't dress up for the men on Thursday morning, all right? <laughs> hey, and, and most of them don't dress up for me either, all right? Trust me, it's, it's, it's not a good-looking group on Thursday morning. Well, sorry, guys. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I look down, it's Mike Dermanuel. Mike never calls me that time of the morning. I'm thinking, oh, this is not good. So I answered, Mike. He said, Tim, I'm going to see you at 830, aren't I? Uh, sure, Mike, where am I going to see you? Well, this is the seniors golf tournament at Fort Washington Country Club, and you're supposed to be giving the devotional this morning. 
Oh, yeah, Mike. Yeah, yeah, Mike. I'm going to be there. Uh, well, they've been trying to leave you messages, but they've been undelivered. Well, here's the deal on that. They had called me back or emailed me back in January. Tim, could you do this event? That was before the wedding. And, and I've done it the previous three years for them, and they, they've been good partners for us with the Hubbard Barrow Golf Tournament in November. And so as an appreciation for me, one, it was nice of them to ask, but I primarily say yes because they say yes to the golf tournament. And, and, and so uh, I said, okay, here's the deal. A few weeks in advance, please send me an update just so I don't forget, all right? And uh, so he showed me his phone when I got to the golf course and said, look, all these came back undelivered. Did you change it? No. Do you see that little exclamation mark next to the text, all right, when it says undelivered? If you were to push on that, it would give you an opportunity to resend it and maybe a different way so it go, oh, I didn't know that. Now, I'm wanting to think, okay, if you did three of these and it didn't get through, why don't you try calling that number? Okay? But anyway, it's, it's not his fault. I, I didn't tell Angel to get it on my schedule. I didn't get the reminders. So anyway, it is now 725. I am to be there at 830. I am in shorts, a t-shirts, and tennis shoes. This is a country club. Okay, I need to go home, shower, shave, and put on respectable clothing. I run home. I do that. I have 25 minutes to get to the other side of town, to the country club, and to speak five minutes after I get there. I have nothing prepared. I'm thinking weddings and funerals, not golf tournament. On the way from my house to there, actually from, from the church to there, I said, Lord, I'm empty. I have no idea. If you don't do something... Nothing good is going to happen today. <laughs> and from here to there, empty, nothing. I said, maybe in the shower. Sometimes I get some great ideas in the shower, all right? Empty. I go to get in the car uh, to head across town. I bought this book at the airport about a month ago. I had not read it. I stuck it in between my seats. It sat there. I hadn't looked at it. Uh, one of the ladies who normally sits right up here, all right, last week had said, Tim, have you seen the book When God Winks at You? I said, I've seen it, but I haven't read it. In fact, I own it, but I haven't. She said, oh, it is so good. So while I'm driving from the house to there, I see this book. I have not read this book. And I'm looking at the title. And I said, God, is this a wink? Is this a wink? And, and, and then I start thinking, why do I wink? Then I thought, when did I learn to wink? And then I thought about my boys. I can remember my boys at probably two to three years of age. You know, because I would wink at them, and they always wanted to wink back, but they couldn't, so they blinked. You know, when you can't wink, you blink. And so the boys would blink back, and, and oh, I remember, man, when they finally figured out how to do just one eye, all right, to, oh, then they winked all the time. You know, they first learned how to do it. And, and, and that, all of that, you're saying, Tim, this doesn't sound like a very good devotional. And, and, but, but then I start thinking, God, why do we wink? Well, I didn't have time to find out why Squire Rushnell says in his book, We Blink, because I couldn't read and drive at the same time. At least I'm not supposed to. And, 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 and so I'm, I'm, my mind just keeps going. And, 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 here, and, and, and here's what I came up with of why normally we wink. It starts out with we want to get somebody's attention. Now, there may be different purposes for why we want their attention, but, but we want their attention. Sometimes it's just to let them know, maybe in a difficult moment, that we're thinking of them. When Chad would head up to, to bat, and he would look my direction before he got there, I'd just wink at him. It was just the fact I'm thinking about you, son. It's going to be okay. Uh, besides winking to get somebody's attention... We wink to get their attention to see if they are interested or encouraged by our wink. 
remember guys? I mean, we, you'd wink at a young lady every now and then, you know? Yeah, yeah. You, you'd kind of see, you know, did they raise their eyebrows in disgust or did they smile? Did they take a second look? I mean, you know, yeah. Did, 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 was there any interest or was there encouragement as a result of the wink? And, 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 and those first two steps lead us to the third one. And that is we wink at somebody with the hope of a good result. When I would wink at Chad going up to bat, it was a hope for a good result. When you wink at somebody across a room, maybe in a difficult situation, you're hoping that they'll feel better about what they're going through. If you're looking for a date, you hope you get it. But you're hoping for a good result. And I thought, wow. I wonder if that's kind of what this guy has in mind. God winks. And then I began to think, have I ever really paid attention when God winks at me? You see, I think it's the little circumstances that come up in our lives that have no explanation that's a God wink. I, I think it's the coincidences that are so crazy coincidental, it's insane. That the, you couldn't have planned that. I think it's the crossing of paths with somebody at just the right moment that even if you'd had it on your schedule for months, it couldn't have worked out this well. I think those are God winks. And why does he do it? B because he wants our attention. Sometimes it's just to encourage us, but it's always with the intent of God saying to you and me, I'm thinking about you. You're the apple of my eye. You are the rainbow on a rainy day in my world. God always winks at us to see if we're interested or encouraged by his presence. And God always winks with the hope of a good result in our lives. All this is happening in a matter of minutes driving across town. And then I started thinking of examples. How, God, God, how am I going to tie it to this group of men? Senior adults on a golf tournament, rather patriotic. It's why we're doing this at the flagpole with the Marine group there to, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and to show and honor colors. So here's just a few of God winks that I thought of in that short trip across town. I thought about some of the stories I've heard from my dad over the years. Though my grandparents were Christians, as often you do when you hit your teen years, and particularly World War II, sometimes you sort of throw your faith aside for a bit. And I've heard dad tell the story in different ways, and I may not get it completely right, but I remember hearing dad talk about having a come-to-Jesus meeting in a foxhole before a battle. That was God winking at him in the midst of some pretty desperate situations that, hey, you just never know. You need to get things right. That was at 19 years old. And in a matter of days, he would get blown up in a street in the battle at Ramogden. Shrapnel embedded in his spine, paralyzed from his waist down. The medics who picked him up didn't think he would live to get him back to the medical facility across the bridge. And they put him and another guy on the hood of a Jeep. That was the medical transport. And they transported him back across the bridge at Ramogden. And the guy driving the Jeep, Dad could overhear him say, One of you boys God must be looking after. Because we're only 50 yards the other side of the bridge. And the Germans just blew the bridge all to hell. It's gone. Ten seconds earlier, they would have been on the bridge. I don't know about you folks, that's God winking big time, man. He might even be blinking. And here Dad is, 91, just reverse the numbers. And he's still walking and living and sharing his love for Jesus. If you take Dad to the ER, just be ready for him to ask the nurse and the doctors who come to check on him, do you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Dad's in ER administering CPR <laughs> to those who are well. I, uh, I was reminded of, in that short journey across town, I was reminded of, of early in my boy's years at Clovis Unified, and 
the principal and Lindsay at Dry Creek ask if I would serve. You've got to remember this is 25, six years ago. And Clovis Unified was just getting a district-wide committee together uh, for cross-cultural communication. How do we improve our cross-cultural relationships? So they had had a small team of just six people, and now they had done some work, and they wanted to share that with representatives from all the schools before they unleashed some printed material and publications district-wide of, of, of how we should think, view, and handle cross-cultural situations. And so there was a Hispanic gentleman from Dry Creek, and there was an Asian gentleman from Dry Creek, and, 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 and then I was chosen, and I, I said, why'd you pick me? And she said, because it's checked on here, you're an American Indian. <laughs> they, they are. My grandfather was uh, not quite half Choctaw Indian, registered on the rolls. I got my card, all right? So uh, now we call them Native Americans. My grandfather always just said, he's an Indian. Uh, he was Choctaw, all right, one of the five civilized tribes of Oklahoma, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cherokee, Creek, and Seminole. Um, we learned that before we learned the alphabet at our house. Um, and, and, and so anyway, I was asked to, to go. And so we went to this meeting where this core team was going to show us their materials and get our input. Well, I went with a gentleman from Dry Creek who was Hispanic, and we were sitting at the same table side by side, and uh, I'm looking at my watch. They're late starting, and Clovis didn't usually work that way. They were usually right on time, but they were late, and finally a, a, a lady stood up and said, we're waiting for uh, the, the chairman of our committee. He got hung up in traffic. He'll be here any minute, and so a few minutes pass. Door opens. We turn and look. Here comes this guy. He's six foot four, six foot five. He is broad shouldered. He is dark complected. And the guy I'm sitting there with, uh, he looks at me and he says, Tim, that is the biggest Mexican I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, He is not Mexican. What do you mean he's not? Look at, he, look at his skin. I said, Look at his face. I said, That is not the face of a Mexican. That is the face of an American Indian. He's probably Cherokee. Guy gets up, he introduces himself, tells us his name, and he said, I'm a full-blooded Choctaw Indian from Oklahoma. Choctaw. <laughs> wow. Obviously, your bloodline was not in my bloodline because I'm <laughs> five foot seven and a half, all right? But anyway, I couldn't wait for him to finish so that afterwards I could go up and introduce myself. I had my card already, you know, to show him I was, you know, part Choctaw Indian and... and um, and, 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 and so uh, we, we talked a little bit about that, and, and, and I, he said, where, where does your bloodline come from? And I said, well, you know, I said, my grandfather. And I said, you know, this is back in the 30s and the 40s. I said, um, my grandfather was quite proud that he was, he was Indian. I said, you know, a lot of his relatives, they, they didn't want anybody to know because they, they could get put down for it. And, but I said, my grandpa, I said, he was so proud of it that, that when he started preaching, he would advertise. Remember, this is the 40s now. When my grandpa's preaching, he would have uh, billboards, posters made to put around towns. He did it in Fireball and Kerman and Fresno and Madera and Selma. And he would hold tent revival meetings, all right? And, and, and on the brochure, it would say, come here, Choctaw Indian evangelist. And even in some of them, he would be in his suit and he would have a headdress on. I, I still have, we, we have that, in fact, that headdress hangs on a wall in, our, in, in one of our rooms in our house. And he said, wow, Indian evangelist. He said, you know, when I lived on the reservation back in Oklahoma as a boy growing up, he said there was this evangelist who used to come every year and he would preach three or four nights in a row. And he said, one night I gave my life to Jesus Christ. That evangelist's name was George McLean. My name, for those of you who don't know, is Tim McLean Rowland. That was my grandfather. Do you think that's a God wink? I think big time that's a God wink. You see, I knew God had called me to preach when I was ten and a half years old. I had turned ten in December. My grandfather died the end of January with a massive heart attack. I was ten. He was, uh, he was 70. And that summer, with my grandmother, my mom, and dad, we drove to Oklahoma, as we had done every summer of my life. And we were in uh, uh, the home and a grocery store. They were connected in a neighborhood of a f couple called the Smithies. And my grandmother, mom, and dad were in the store part. And I was left, I don't know why they left me in their living room, but I was there all alone, sitting in a rocking chair. I'm ten and a half years old, and I start crying. And the reason I was crying was twofold. One, I miss my grandfather. 
But number two, here's what I knew, and this is going to sound so bizarre. I knew at that moment that God had called me to preach, and who's going to believe a 10-year-old? And so I didn't tell anybody. Fast forward five years. I'm 15 years old. One of my best friends is, um, is, is a preacher's daughter. Her dad was president of the Bible college at the time. Her name was Debbie. And Debbie and I were very good friends, and she had gone home with our family after church for lunch, hang out, till we went back for church in the evening. And um, while, we were, while we were hanging out together, she looks over at me, and she says, what's the matter, Tim? I'm 15 years old. I said, nothing's the matter, Debbie. I'm just fine. No, no, something's bothering you. I said, Deb, I'm, I'm good. God's called you to preach, hadn't he? What are you talking about? I'm 15 years old. You know, you've been fighting this for a while, haven't you? I argued and fussed, and she said, tell you what, I'll make you a deal. We had a guest preacher that night going to be at Dad's church. His name was Bob Shockey, big old boy from West Virginia. And um, she said, if Bob preaches something that just really confirms you're, God's called you to preach, then tonight you'll go forward and acknowledge it. I said, not a problem. Bob was half comedian. <laughs> but Bob took 20 minutes before he ever got to the sermon telling stories and jokes. And I said, not a problem. We got to church that night. We're sitting about seven, eight rows back on the right side, sitting next to each other. Dad introduces Bob Shockey. Bob Shockey gets up. He doesn't tell one joke. He doesn't tell one story. He turns to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and the first words out of his mouth is, by the foolishness of preaching, God will save some. Do you think God winked? I think God winked. This merger of New Hope Church was a God wink. It wasn't an idea in anybody's mind. If you're new here, go online, read the whole story. But again, it was at a Dry, dry Creek School event. I'm emceeing an event for the principal. After that's over, a guy who lives in the two-story yellow house just down the street from here, Lee Copeland, walked up to me and said, Are you a pastor? We need one. I said, Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm already pastor of church. I'm in Fresno. And on the way home that night... God said, why don't you bring two churches together? Churches usually split. Why don't you do something different? Why don't you bring two together? And so God took two small congregations, one in Fresno and one here in Clovis, and he brought them together. That was a God wink. Um, there's a new family, and I won't take much time telling that story, but there's a new family in our church, the Lucero family. Um, a few months ago, I told you about a lady hugging me over here at the end of a memorial service with tears streaming down her face, and she said, you preached Peter Holder's funeral, didn't you? And that was 15 years ago, 16 years ago. I said, yes, I did. She said, my son and I stood up at the end of that service and gave our life to Jesus Christ. I just want to thank you very much. I'd never seen this lady in my life. 15, 16 years have passed. I go to my office to get something. I come back. This lady's been at the end of the line getting her food, and she's getting her drink from Shelly, and all of a sudden she sets her cup down, and she hugs Shelly. I walk up at that moment, and I said, you know you're hugging my wife. She said, you know I'm hugging my cousin? <laughs> That's a God wink, guys. Who could plan something like that? They hadn't seen each other in over 20 years. They were in the 8 o'clock service this morning, and normally between 9.15 or 10.45, six or eight of them are sitting right up here on the front row. They've been coming for ever since then. Mike Dermanuel Sr., who's sitting in this service today, God winked at him in an ER room at Fresno Community Hospital on the night that his stepson, Austin, was involved in a car accident at the corner of Shaw and DeWolf. They were on their way as freshmen in college to coach a a basketball team at uh, the junior high at Clovis East. It's brand new. They got T-boned by a car going through a country intersection. Two young men in that car. Um, I had known, I had known one of their parents of both of those young men back in high school. They were in the ER, unsure if either one of them would live. And I got a call from a neighbor saying, Tim, you need to get down there those families are going to need somebody. I walk in. I'd never met Mike Dermanuel Sr. before. Had I known he was a Winchell kid, I would have liked him, but I didn't know that, and so I didn't know him. And that night, God winked at the Dermanuel family, and over the course of the next couple of weeks and months, Mike gave his life to Jesus Christ. 
been part of our family ever since then. It was a God wink in a hospital room. Last story. It's really what ties this whole thing together. Tomorrow's memorial service for a guy by the name of Wayne Morgan. Wayne Morgan and the Stokel family have relationships. Two years ago, Wayne Morgan uh, was diagnosed with cancer and it was pretty serious. And uh, I was asked by the Stokel family if I would call them. And so I called and left three messages for this couple. I never got a response back. A couple of weeks ago, before I left for Cabo, I get a call on a Monday morning, and it is, uh, it's Wayne's wife. She says, Tim, I, first off, I want to say thank you for calling us two years ago. Um, we really thought we were going to need you then, but um, Wayne responded so well to treatment, he got so much better. And I thought, how often do we do that? We only look for God when we're in trouble, when things smooth out. We, not, not realizing, folks, it's going to be smooth only for a little while. <laughs> it's, going to get, it's going to get rough again down the road. And she said, so, so we didn't, but we, we got bad news last week, and, and, and Wayne has taken a real turn for the worse, and I'm, I'm sorry we didn't call sooner. She said, we've been told we have a couple of weeks, maybe to a couple of months, and so uh, wondering if you'd come by and see him. It's the day before I was heading for vacation, long list of things to get done, and, and she said, no rush, just come see us when you get back. And I said, um, okay. I hung up the phone, and man, I, it, it just didn't seem right. So I picked up the phone, I called back, I said, I don't know what your schedule is, but can I come this morning? Sometime in the next hour or two, can I come? I won't stay long if I just think I ought to meet him before I leave. She said, oh, that'd be great. Yeah, come right on over. So I did. Stayed three hours. I stayed three hours. Visited with her, visited with her daughter from out of town. I visited with Wayne. Had the opportunity to pray with Wayne. I asked, uh, I asked Wayne's wife, I said, besides the Stokel connection, why did you... Why did you ask for the Stokels to call? And she said, well, actually, my husband told me. You see, he's been going to the Hubbard Barrow Golf Tournament ever since it's been at Fort Washington. And he came home one day at the end of a tournament, and he said, whenever I die, I want you to get that guy from the flagpole. He had no idea when he told her that, that he would be diagnosed with cancer just a year or two later. And so I was the guy at the flagpole. So when I spoke at Fort Washington on Thursday, do you know what I was standing next to? I was standing next to a flagpole just four days before I'm going to do a memorial service for a guy who met me at a flagpole when God winks at you. Are you interested? And you see, I had the privilege of praying with him to receive Christ. Uh, the rest of the story, there was a phone message on my phone that had come while I was on the airplane Tuesday morning from Fresno to Phoenix. And the message was, Tim, we're so surprised. Wayne died this morning. I saw him Monday because God winked and said, don't wait. Do you recognize the wink of God in your life? Let me close with this story out of the book because I think you should go buy the book. Because remember, everything I've said to you now, I had never read the book. Here's one story. It's here. In Anaheim, California... Marvis Jackson drove past the Crystal Cathedral. Remember that? Bob Shuler's church. For 20 years, she said the same thing. Someday I'm going there. One Sunday morning she did. Put on her best outfit. Today's the day. Getting there early, she took a seat. She could not believe this 3,000-seat mega church. She sat in awe of the majestic voices of the choir. She marveled at the manner of those huge windows that opened up as if they were inviting the birds to come in and worship with them. At the end of the service, Mavis stood and waited for the aisle to clear. Trying not to sound too excited, she said to the young lady who had been sitting next to her, I'm so glad I came today. Wasn't this wonderful? The young woman just nodded. Are you from around here? asked Mavis. No, I'm from the Midwest, the young woman said. I'm actually here on a mission. I'm here to find my birth mother. 
There was this pause. I, I, I know how you must feel, said Mavis. A long time ago, I had to give up my little girl for adoption. I didn't want to, but no other choice. A long pause. The young woman looked deeply into Mavis's eyes and said, do, do you by any chance remember your baby daughter's birthday? Oh, yes, I do. I've never forgotten it. October 30th. That's my birthday, the younger woman said. A remarkable coincidence? A God wink, I suggest to you, had reunited a long-lost mother and a daughter. What are the odds that a woman living in Orange County and a woman visiting from the Midwest looking for her mother would sit next to each other in the Crystal Cathedral on the very same Sunday? Cheryl, the young woman, explained that for years she had been haunted by the uncertainty of not knowing her birth mother. In her small Midwest town, everybody discouraged her. It'll just lead to heartache. There's no trace of her. You have no idea where to start. But one person eventually suggested, I think I heard that your mother moved to Orange County. Even on the most optimistic day, Cheryl never would have forecast this remarkable outcome. When they confirmed the wonderful miracle that they really were, the lost mother and daughter, they knew the next Mother's Day would never, ever be the same. What could we learn from stories like this? That there is a mighty force out there bigger than all of us, directing our lives, determining our steps, bringing certainty out of uncertainty. I don't know why God brought you here today. I don't know why God decided to change the sermon for today. I would suggest to you, it's a God wink. Don't miss it. Will you let hope be the end result of God winking at you today? Let's pray. Father, for your love for us, we simply say thank you for your, for your expressing interest in our lives. There's probably not a bigger wink than, than the cross and the tomb. But God, in the little adventures of life, you are winking at us to see if we are interested in you. Thank you for showing interest in us. I will leave you to the hope-filled outcomes of today. In Jesus' name, amen.